Giuliani Cato Krell. Uh, I serve on the board of the Rockwood Park Preservation Society. We are here in the conservatory of the Rockwood Mansion. And I'm here with my distinguished guest, Senator Margaret Rose Henry. Uh, welcome, Senator Henry. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the exhibit that is coming up really is a bit of like a fashion show. All of the models will be stationed throughout the mansion and then our visitors will be able to kind of have a mansion tour as well as seeing all the lovely outfits and ensembles. The ensembles will also have a message of women's progression from post-Civil War era all the way until the ratification of the 19th Amendment um, and how those fashions uh, reflected these feminist movements. Um, so you are so instrumental since you were born in 1944? Yes. And tell us about your um, early childhood life in Louisiana. Right. Well, first of all, in 1944, as you know, during those times, it was a lot of strife regarding civil rights for uh, blacks. And uh, so there was real segregation in the community that I grew up in. Uh, so I can remember not being able to ride the bus, for example, uh, having to, uh, to go to church. Even the church was segregated. There was only one church in my parish, and we had to sit at the back of the church. And so those were memories that, that really impacted me and in my, in my life. And one of the things I thought about very early was, I need to get an education and get the heck out of here. Yes! <laughs> so, uh, and about 11 years later, I had an opportunity to go and live with uh, my mother. My grandmother brought me up until that time. And I lived in Houston, Texas. And I went to a segregated, uh, it was a combination of middle and high school. Uh, but it was a separate but equal concept where schools were developed for blacks. They were supposed to be equal, but they were not equal. Our science labs were not equal. But our teachers were so committed, so I believe that I got a great education. Uh, one of the things that prompted me to think I could do well was my guidance counselor, Mr. Harold Johnson. His impact on my life, I'm sure he will never know, or he would not have known. Uh, when we, had a, we had an open house for parents, and he used my test scores to put on the bulletin board to show what I was doing, and I tested in the 98th percentile in English and reading and history and science, and I was a seventh grader. I didn't know I had that kind of potential, so that really motivated me to think that I could do well. So I graduated first in my class and went and got the only scholarship we had, and I went on to college. Oh. And uh, but I also got married at 19 because I grew up in a very strict Catholic family, and I was not allowed to date. I was uh, valedictorian. I was queen of my high school, and I didn't even know how to dance. <laughs> I can, and at that time, the, your escort was the football captain. So he came to my house to teach me how to waltz so that we could have a coronation ball. Oh. And so those are some interesting memories to have as you're growing up, you know. But then I went away. My first college experience was at an all-girls Catholic college, believe it or not, Seton Hill in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I spent a year there, and it was very difficult. I was their first resident black student. They had day students but I was the first resident black student. And I thought, oh my God, I'll die a virgin here. <laughs> but uh, I, I did a year there, and then I transferred to Texas Southern University and uh, got married at 19, and, and my life moved forward after that. So you were home in college when you married. Yes. So your husband really supported your uh, seeking higher education. Right. Well, he, he, right. He, he, his parents were educators. They had taught at a college called Purdue A&M College, which was a small uh, uh, black uh, college in Texas. And so he had grown up in a, in a family that valued education. Oh. So he encouraged me at age 19. I continued going to college, and he worked. He worked for the Fisher Pond Company. And so fast forward to. A few years, we moved to Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, we've gotten divorced uh, at that time, and I have two boys, and so I worked on bringing them up and uh, working. And so most of my life has been spent working in nonprofits. Uh, my major in college was sociology and psychology, and I did that because I wanted to have a better understanding of, of dynamics of how people can, can uh, effectively 
uh, understand and learn better and also how to be responsible for one's community. Mm -hmm. So most of my life's work has been with youth, families, the elderly. And uh, I always said to the, to the uh, colleagues when I was elected to the Senate, I was the only one with life experiences on solving real human problems. Right, right. Because, uh, and while you were here in Wilmington, Delaware, you also pursued your master's degree. I did. And you headed off something called the Women's Center at the Dell Tech. My Dell goodness, Center. you have really done your homework. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I spent 10 years uh, working for Delaware Technical and Community College, and during that time I started the Women's Center. And I also uh, created something called the Wall of Fame for Hispanic and African Americans to be recognized for their contributions to the community. The other thing I did that was most interesting was I created uh, opportunities for for the students at the Stan and Wilmington campuses to have debates on the current issues of the day. So I like to think that I raised their consciousness about what was going on in the world. Yeah. And, and is that how, what led you to run for Senate? No, actually I was recruited. I was recruited, and it was such a long time, way before you were born. Uh, I was recruited actually by the Republican Party, even though I'm a Democrat. Uh, I got a call one day from a good friend of mine and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm taking a nap. <laughs> it was a Saturday morning. And she said, let's have coffee. And, and Senator Herman Holloway had died in office. He was the first African American to serve in the Delaware General Assembly. And when he died, it created a, a vacancy. So the Republican Party recruited me. I had had no political experience, but I had done a lot of work. I'd been chairman of the State Arts Council. I'd done all kinds of volunteer stuff. So I was known, but not to the political world. So I had a race in three weeks, if you can imagine that. Oh my. And I, I had a lot of opponents, and I won. And uh, I can remember James Baker was mayor then, and he said, that's just a fluke, you know, that you could win. But I went on to have a primary that September, this was April of, of, of that year, and in September I had a primary and ran against the same people that I won again. But then the Democratic Party tried to sue to get me off off the ballot because I wouldn't sit with them. I believe I had to have loyalty to the people who brought me to the Senate. Mm -hmm. So I sat with the Republicans. So they went to the Supreme Court of Delaware to make the decision, believe it or not. And, and I can remember that uh, my case had to be defended and it was a would've if you could've. There was not, that there, there are laws that allow when you can change political parties and the law had not allowed that. So that's why I was able to keep my seat. So. It was a harrowing experience to be the first African-American woman in the Senate. There were only four women. Mm -hmm. And so everyone was looking at me with, what is she about? You know, what is she going to talk about? What, is, what are her efforts and her, her initiatives? And of course, I represented the lowest income district, the most minority district. So I came with a full agenda of what needed to be done. And it was difficult, quite frankly. They used to call bills, I, I, I did something on a sexual orientation. They called it my Twinkie bill, for example or I tried to do things on, uh, I created the Office of Women's Health, and they said, well, the men don't have an office. I said, well, most of the national testing during those times was done just for men, mm -hmm. and they were the standard by which healthcare was decided. So it was a trying time, but I, I started off uh, sitting with the Republicans, and eventually I did go back to becoming a Democrat. Right, right. And how long did you serve in the Senate? 24 and a half years. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> and you know, I kept thinking, every year I want to retire, because I had spent 30 years in the nonprofit, mm -hmm. so I had worked 50 years, and I'm only 12. So that was a lot of work, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of time spent. But one of the things that I'm most grateful for is that when I started, there was all this distension, but by the time I left, I, had, I, was, I, left, I was the majority leader of the Senate, mm -hmm. and the, the Democrats, and so that meant every day I, I, I called the agenda and called for the bills, and so it, I made progress. I made real progress. Yeah. Well, now we thank you for joining us today, and before we go, you had such an illustrious career and a long journey from Louisiana oh, yes. to the Senate. Um, so what ideas or words, words of wisdom might you share for a lot of young women today that still are facing race, gender, and sexual orientation discrimination? Right. You know, I watched the new young senators, and I'm, when I was there, I was the only one. Now they're like three and four in the Senate. It's just wonderful to see the synergy that a group can, can, can come together and do. 
And the, the, there's a bill called The Crown about women's, how they wear their hair, African American women with braids, they're discriminated against, against in the workplace. So there are efforts to do that. I think there's much, much more acceptance of differences between people. And I'm hoping that I had some impact. I'm told that I am by some of, because I get a lot of calls yes. that, I, that I've made an impact and I left a legacy that, that uh, encourages and nurtures the new young legislators. Well, you definitely did, and congratulations on the new bridge named after you. Oh, did you know about that? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. It, it's, it's amazing. Uh, some of, a lot of uh, public officials were there, and I remember Senator Crawford said, I did all the work to get the money for this. How did they name the bridge? I didn't. <laughs> but it was a true honor, and, and it's something I can leave for my grandchildren because they can go say, that's my Mimi's bridge. Yes. You know? So that was impressive, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And um, I think the, it, 